Do you know when the idea of an atomic bomb first entered the public realm? Do you think it was 1933 when Leo Szilard first conceived of chain reaction? Maybe 1939 when Lise Meitner and Otto Frisch wrote down the theoretical framework for fission. What about one month later when the French team proved that a nuclear chain reaction could actually be achieved and established the critical mass? The complete history of a scientific journey to an atomic bomb is long and complicated. But did you know that the first depiction of its potential use as a weapon comes from science fiction? This is Science According to Oppenheimer. You guys, it's rare that a movie has like mass appeal to scientists, specifically to physicists. But there's one movie that has our community buzzing with excitement and that is Oppenheimer. I know that many people have feelings about like Christopher Nolan movies, but that man knows how to do science. And Killian Murphy, good God, like what a brilliant actor. And I'm not saying that because I'm biased as an Irish person. I'm biased because I'm from Cork. Now, I went into this movie genuinely excited and admittedly thrilled by the lineup of historical figures Bohr, Einstein, Heisenberg, Fermi, Lawrence, Szilard, the list goes on. The movie takes place over a 40 year period of the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, and it's based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book American Prometheus, written by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin. Now, this book was written over a period of 30 years using letters, reports, interviews with many of the people involved to create a really detailed account of Oppie's life and his influence. The early 1900s were a golden age in physics. Oppenheimer studied chemistry at Harvard, decided he'd prefer physics and spent a year at Cambridge in the UK. He hated it with a passion. And then he ended up in Göttingen for his PhD where he became heavily focused on quantum mechanics, which was only just being formulated there. Oppenheimer was actually the one to bring this new quantum theory to America and when he started teaching it at Berkeley. Throughout this period of his life, he met, befriended and worked with some of the most influential figures in history. People like Ernest Lawrence, who created the first cyclotron, Niels Bohr of the Bohr model of the atom, Richard Feynman, path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, Enrico Fermi, who built the first ever nuclear reactor, Seth Patrick Blackett, who proved nuclear transmutation due to radioactivity, Werner Heisenberg. This man was awarded the Nobel Prize for the creation of quantum mechanics. And of course, you know, Einstein. Now, the character list for this movie includes 11 Nobel Prize winners, 11. Admittedly, we don't see much of these characters because the central focus of the movie is Oppenheimer himself and the world from his perspective. And while I really enjoyed this movie and thought it was fascinating to see the story on film, it's important to remember the weight of the events surrounding World War II and the profound impact of developing the atomic bomb. Personally, I have mixed feelings about this piece of history. Like on the one hand, I want to acknowledge the scientific merit, but on the other, we have to address the ethical implications of the research that continues to shape our world today. My point is, or the reason I bring this up, is just to say don't mistake my enthusiasm for understanding the history of science and research for a lack of remorse or empathy for how it was used. Having said all that, let's get into the science behind Oppenheimer. To understand the origins of nuclear weapons, we can trace back to the early 1900s when scientists like Ernest Rutherford, Frederick Soddy and Patrick Blackett were working on transmutation. So let's start with the difference between transmutation and fission. Now they're both nuclear processes that involve changes in the nucleus of an atom. When JJ Thomson discovered the electron in 1897, people started to wonder if you could break up an atom. In 1901, Ernest Rutherford, along with Frederick Soddy, were investigating atomic disintegration, radioactive emissions of elements such as radium, thorium and uranium occurring in conjunction with the spontaneous transmutation of individual atoms into other chemical species. Atoms are undergoing a process called beta decay, which converts protons to neutrons or neutrons to protons and releases energy in the process. And since elements are defined by the number of protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus, this meant elements were changing into other elements. At the time of this work, they didn't know how to describe the process. They didn't know about the proton and the neutron. They hadn't been discovered yet. 
Frederick Soddy was fascinated by what was happening in Rutherford's lab and he started to give a series of lectures looking at how this could be interpreted. What if there's energy stored in the atomic nucleus? Because if that's the case and we could find a way to release it, then the possibilities for atomic energy were immense. In 1908 he wrote, Looking backwards at the great things science had already accomplished and the steady growth in power and fruitfulness of scientific method, it could scarcely be doubted that one day we should come to break down and build up elements in the laboratory as we now break down and build up chemical compounds and the pulses of the world would then throb with a new force. What he imagined was an atomic powered humanity able to transform a desert continent thaw the frozen poles and make the whole world one smiling garden of Eden. Perhaps a tad idealistic, but it had an influence on the author H.G. Wells. Looking at Sadi's lectures, he wrote his 1913 story, The World Set Free, predicting a world of the future and a new weapon. In this novel, he writes, Never before in the history of warfare had there been a continuing explosive. Indeed, up to the middle of the 20th century, the only explosives known were combustibles, whose explosiveness was due entirely to their instantaneousness. And these atomic bombs, which science burst upon the world that night, were strange even to the men who used them. You guys, science fiction has such freedom to be able to take scientific ideas, envision all the possibilities of what could be done without needing to fully understand or explain the scientific basis. But it can also be a great predictor of the future. Natural transmutation happens in unstable radioactive elements such as thorium or uranium. Artificial transmutation was first achieved in 1925 by Patrick Blackett and it happens when you bombard an atom with other nuclei or particles. The intention is to force the nucleus into an unstable state and induce transmutation. In 1932 then, James Chadwick discovered the neutron. This opened up a whole new batch of experiments because neutrons are neutrally charged, meaning that they're not repelled by the positively charged nucleus of an atom. So they're easier and cheaper to use when you want to bombard another atom. Now, two things can happen when bombarding with neutrons. Number one, you introduce instability, forcing beta decay and the transmutation of one element into another. This is what happens in nuclear reactors when uranium-238 is converted into plutonium-239. The second thing is you introduce an instability that forces the atom to split apart, creating two smaller atoms. This is what happens when uranium-235 absorbs a neutron and ultimately splits into two smaller atoms in a reaction that also releases a large amount of energy. We know now that the second process is fission, but it wasn't until 1938 when chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann in Germany actually achieved fission that it was first described. Now, back in 1933, Leo Szilard, in thinking about Rutherford's experiments and the discovery of the neutron, conceived of the nuclear chain reaction. He thought, if you use a neutron to split an atom, what if, alongside the two new atoms, you also got some more neutrons? Well, then they'd be available to split other atoms and you could create a chain reaction. At the time, he thought you might be able to use this to like magnify energy, maybe using a cathode ray. He even filed a patent, but nothing about this idea implied fission or large energy release. So when Hahn and Strassmann conducted their experiment in December of 1938, they found that when bombarding uranium with neutrons, they were detecting barium. Now, they didn't know how to interpret this, so they sent their results to their colleague, physicist Lise Meitner, who was in Sweden at the time. And she worked out the theoretical basis for what was happening. Her nephew, Otto Frisch, then repeated the experiment, verified the results, and coined the term fission. Fission is a modified radioactive decay reaction. It can occur naturally in some cases, but it is mostly an induced artificial reaction. It's separate from transmutation and releases far more energy. So how did this event, the discovery of fission, lead to the creation of an atomic bomb, the future that H.G. Wells had envisioned 20 years earlier? 
In the movie Oppenheimer, it seems as if Han and Strassman achieve fission and immediately America started making a bomb. In reality, while the implication for energy release was there, there were a few more pivotal steps before the idea moved from scientific curiosity to military strategy. Almost as soon as Han, Meitner, Strassman and Frisch confirmed fission, scientists around the world were replicating the experiment. In February of 1939, just one month after the confirmation of fission, a group in France found that when they split uranium-238, two or three more neutrons were also created. This meant that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction would be possible, as suggested by Leo Szilard six years earlier. Now, one member of the French team, Perrin, defined one of the most important terms, the critical mass. This is the smallest amount of the material that's required to sustain this chain reaction. For uranium-238, he calculated it to be about 40 tons. Now, this is the reason why many weren't too concerned about its potential use as a weapon. Because even if you could gather 40 tons of uranium, what would you do with it? It's 40,000 kilograms. Apparently, a 1979 Volkswagen Beetle weighs one ton. So what are you going to do with 40 Beetles? Now, there is one other challenge, and this was to do with a moderator. It was found that you needed the neutrons to be slower in order to induce fission. However, the ones that were created were quite fast. So a moderator was required. This could be either graphite or heavy water. But at the time, there was only one place in Norway that you could get heavy water. So this is where we stand in 1939, just before World War II breaks out. Fission has been discovered. It's possible to generate a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, releasing large amounts of energy. But to do it, you would need 40 tons of uranium, along with a lot of heavy water to moderate it. Now, there's absolutely no way that this could be airborne. Still, Germany, the UK and the US have all established programs looking into the feasibility of this. And from this moment on, science is on lockdown. The moment things changed was in England when Niels Bohr proposed that it was actually a rare isotope of uranium, uranium-235, that was causing the fission reaction. You see, uranium-238 makes up 99.3% of all uranium, whereas uranium-235 is only 0.7%. But the realization changed the critical mass value. So instead of needing 40 tons of material, you would only need one kilogram. In the UK, Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perls presented a memorandum showing that if you could find a way to isolate one kilogram of uranium-235, then it was viable to create an airborne nuclear weapon. And from this moment on, the creation of an atomic bomb became a military goal, and the Manhattan Project was officially established in 1941. Another development that directed the course of the work of the Manhattan Project was the discovery of the transmutation of uranium-238 into plutonium-239. Now, a fissile material is something that is capable of a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, undergoing fission and releasing large amounts of energy. They are extremely rare. There's actually only four. Uranium-233, uranium-235, plutonium-239, and plutonium-241. Now, Uranium-233 and plutonium-241 don't work for an atomic bomb for a number of reasons that we won't get into, but there were now two materials that would be able to sustain a nuclear fission chain reaction, but neither material was readily available. So the scientists had two challenges, find a way to isolate uranium-235 and find a way to create more plutonium-239. A lab was built at Oak Ridge where scientists worked on gaseous diffusion techniques to separate out the uranium-235 isotope, while a nuclear reactor was built at Hanford to transmute uranium-238 into plutonium-239. It took two years to collect the amount of material they needed. Meanwhile, at Los Alamos. Knowing you can create a chain reaction and collecting enough rare material is only one small part of the process. The scientific community established at Los Alamos for 27 months worked on the overall design of the bomb itself, how to build it and detonate it. They were the ones working on how you produce a nuclear explosion. Now they focus on two methods, the gun mechanism, which was simpler but less powerful, and the implosion mechanism, which was way more complicated but highly effective. 
In the gun mechanism, an explosive propellant fires one subcritical mass into another subcritical mass. Now this method was the simplest and least technically demanding method of generating a nuclear explosion. However, it was also slower. It used a lot more fissile material and was less powerful. It was also unsuitable for use with plutonium-239. For these reasons, a lot of focus was placed on the far more complicated implosion mechanism. The way this works is that an initial chemical explosion compresses the fissile material, driving it inwards into a denser critical mass, resulting in a much more powerful explosion while using less material. Ultimately, they opted to make two types of the bomb. Little Boy used the gun mechanism to trigger uranium-235. This one they knew would work. Fat Man was an implosion type design using plutonium-239. This one they weren't so sure about. And so, on the 16th of July, 1945, they tested it, detonating the world's first ever nuclear weapon in the Trinity test. This achievement, while remarkable from a scientific standpoint, also raises critical questions about the responsibility of science and its applications. Driven by the fear of, like, what if the enemy builds it first, the scientists involved felt, at the time, they were doing the right thing. However, most would come to regret their involvement, and Oppenheimer himself would be plagued for the rest of his life over what was brought into the world under his watch. Rudolf Perls famously said, Once fission had been discovered, you couldn't undiscover it. But in hindsight, we can't help but wonder if there could have been a different path. As we look back at history, we must learn from the choices made and the consequences faced. The decision to develop nuclear weapons was complex and driven by unique circumstances. And while we can't change the past, we can use it as a lesson to be mindful of the ethical implications of scientific advancements today. I'm Abby, and this was Science According to Oppenheimer. Thanks for watching.